Okay, thank you very much um, for hanging in with us. It's been a long day. Uh, hopefully you've enjoyed uh, uh, what our speakers have had to say. Um, we're finally, we're going to go into our last session. Um, and um, our first speaker will be uh, Katie Daffin of the FTC. Uh, and I've got to find you up here. And I'm got to replace pin. And there you are, Katie. Good afternoon, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me okay. I am so thrilled to be here and um, to have benefited from all of the wonderful work that the other presenters have put in. It's just been incredibly dynamic and compelling. And um, that includes even all the critiques of the FTC that I've been hearing today. Um, but it, it really is wonderful to, um, to hear from all of these advocates for consumers. And um, from all different angles of, of a very complex set of issues. I hope that what I will provide today will also be of interest, definitely more on the dry side of today's presentations, um, but uh, wanted to unpack some of the FTC's legal work in this area that is uh, above and beyond what we're doing on the law enforcement side, which Claire Wack discussed this morning. Um, but that is still very relevant to the issue of pyramid schemes. So in order to do this, I need to first give some background information, and then I'll be talking about notices of um, penalty offenses, rulemaking initiatives, and mentioning consumer business education and research at the end. The background information is really just one slide, and this is something that Dr. Bosley mentioned this morning in her presentation. She mentioned a Supreme Court case. Um, and this was part of my presentation because it really is affecting things at the FTC right now. Um, and not everyone may be aware of it. But for four decades, the FTC used our statute, the FTC Act, and a section of it, 13B, to get court orders that uh, required defendants to pay refunds to make consumers whole if they had committed unfair or deceptive practices or to turn over all their profits that they had gotten from that activity. And over the years, we actually um, collected tens of billions of dollars and returned it to consumers in the form of refunds. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, but um, in, as you can see here, uh, well, I said a little bit first about the case in 2016, this case, AMG Capital Management versus FTC, we got a $1.3 billion judgment um, in a payday loan related case. That went to the Supreme Court, um, which issued a decision in April of 2021, holding that that section of the FTC Act that we've been using, Section 13B, does not authorize us to seek or a court to award equitable monetary relief, such as restitution or disgorgement. And this has severely hindered our work. Um, it's, it's a complex set of issues. One thing I can say is that a rule violation does make it easier for us to get refunds for consumers quickly. Um, but a lot of deceptive and unfair practices don't come along with rule violations. You know, we have certain rules like telemarketing sales rule, Restore Online Shoppers Confidence Act about recurring payments. But um, a lot of our work against pyramid cases has not involved rule violations. And the Advocare case that you heard about this morning is a good example. Uh, in that complaint, we did not allege any rule violations. We got $150 million uh, for consumer refunds. And that is an example of the kind of thing that is just going to be a lot more complicated to do in the wake of the Supreme Court case. So the FTC has called on Congress to amend the FTC Act, fix this problem. You know, we've had bipartisan support for the work we've been, do, been doing for many, many years, but um, we've had no dice on that so far. Um, and that's just, I think, important background for some of the things that I'm going to talk about um, that lie sort of outside of our typical law enforcement cases that Claire mentioned. We're getting creative. And, and this sort of explains why. So one of the ways we're getting creative, notices of penalty offenses. Um, and this has come up, um, but it's a complex topic. And um, so I just wanted to quickly say what that is. Um, so we have a provision. People who are on notice 
that the FTC issued an order saying that a certain thing is unfair or deceptive, who then go on to do that thing, may be subject to civil penalties. Um, and this is not something that every law enforcement agency has. Um, it's a, it's a um, unique, interesting provision. The civil penalty amount can be significant right now, over $50,000 per violation is the amount. And so in order to um, effectively be able to use this tool that we have, we have uh, over the years sometimes issued notices of penalty offenses. And so uh, again, a horrible name, Michelle's gonna workshop that one with me too, maybe. <laughs> um, but this is a document that lists certain types of conduct that the FTC determined uh, to be unfair or deceptive in a, in a litigated administrative case. And so we've approved these notices of penalty offenses about various product categories and types of claims, including weight loss, debt collection, and toys. Um, and we have a whole list of them on our website, which also has copies of all of the cases underlying each of the notices, if people are interested in any of those areas. Um, particularly of interest to us here uh, are a few recent notices, primarily the first two, the notice concerning money-making opportunities and um, the notice concerning endorsements. And um, let's see. So the money-making opportunity notice of penalty offenses. Um, we sent this one actually along with the endorsement one to more than 1,100 businesses that pitch money-making ventures in October of 2021. And um, this, again, you know, a new tool being creative, this reaches back, explains our cases from decades. So we pulled all the way back to these two pyramid cases in 1974 and a bunch of other cases and laid out. Here are all the things that the commission has determined to be unfair or deceptive practices when you're talking about a money-making opportunity, including pyramid schemes like Holiday Magic and Jeremiah. And here I've listed just some of the, um, of the actual practices that we listed there, such as misrepresenting that people don't need experience in order to make income or misrepresenting that someone has to act immediately or that a certain amount or type of training will be given to participants. But this is a pretty long document. It has a lot of different um, types of claims that were listed there. So those 1,100 businesses, as folks have looked into them, they've seen that it sort of covers the landscape of MLMs in addition to uh, some other different types of, um, of outfits. And um, and that was what I wanted to say about that, although I'm happy to answer questions if we have time. And one of the questions that has come up in the Q&A uh, relates to um, civil penalties. So I'll just take it now and fit it in because a few people asked um, when Claire talked about the doTERRA settlements with participants of doTERRA who had made COVID claims, whether it would be possible to also hold the company liable for those um, for those claims, and you know, I'm not really going to be able to answer any question about that particular case uh, because I can't talk about anything non-public, which is just going to make my whole talk today really uh, not satisfying at all. Um, but I will say that just you can look at FTC case law and say see that um, that there is agent liability for the claims made by your agents. And, and so that's an important concept, um, you know, but every case is different. We look very carefully at every single case and, you know, we're a law enforcement agency. We have to, to do that with extreme care. And so um, I can't really answer the question about that, but I did just want to say, it's not only that participants are liable for the harmful claims they make. Um, if they're the agents of a company, then the company is also liable um, in our view from harmful claims by participants. Okay, so let me go on from there to rulemaking initiatives. Um, we heard a lot already today about the earnings claim rulemaking that we have ongoing at the FTC. Um, and um, this advance notice of proposed rulemaking was issued in February 2022 um, and specifically mentioned that we've seen a lot of concerning earnings claims in, a, in various different industries, including the MLM industry, 
industry, by for-profit colleges, by gig economy platforms. Um, and um, because of the situation with the AMG Supreme Court case, really important for us to pursue additional tools when looking across the marketplace at concerning earnings claims. So um, I am so happy and grateful uh, to say that we received 1,590 comments or more. Um, it's just tremendous public engagement with this rulemaking. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to pause on this point because uh, I listed here some of the, the types of comments that we received, but really the quality, the nature of the comments about multi-level marketing is absolutely striking and just incredibly um, helpful to us. Many of them provide minute, detailed accounts of personal experiences that walk through exactly what happened for individuals. Um, and you know, of course, we know that any one individual story is not going to represent every person who who has had an experience with the company. And, and obviously, some people report happy experiences with MLMs. But I will say that we did hear from a variety of commenters about some issues. Um, and I won't list them all, but just on a very general level, you know, false promises of wealth and um current participants making extreme lifestyle claims, either with words or images or in other ways, deceptive health claims, um, and also accounts of people who were instructed by a company or by an upline to make deceptive claims. Um, so I did just want to say that that has been extremely, extremely valuable in looking at, um, at this advance notice of proposed rulemaking. Um, and let's see. So the other one is the business opportunity rulemaking. So, um, just in case anyone doesn't know the business opportunity rule, unlike the earnings claim thing that I just talked about, this is an existing rule that the FTC has. Um, it prohibits folks who are selling a business opportunity from making deceptive statements and requires them to make particular disclosures to potential buyers who then also have to wait seven days after receiving the disclosures before making any kind of payment or, or signing a contract. Um, so also this past year, we saw comment from the public on that rule, the need for it, its benefits, and costs, level of compliance with it, any changes that people think should be made. And um, in doing so, the agency noted that people who filed uh, comments to the earnings claim advance notice of proposed rulemaking rule making, did not need to go and refile those comments that we would basically consider consider them in connection with the business opportunity rule as well. So we received an additional 32 comments as part of that rulemaking. And um, while I won't be able to actually talk about the merits of either of those rulemaking proceedings, all of which is non-public, um, and it's going to be, you know, uh, perhaps frustrating for folks and I can't ask questions about that. So I'm sorry, um, answer questions about that. Um, but I did just want to sort of lay out what the process is to give people a sense. Um, and there are going to be multiple times for interested people to weigh in. Um, and so um, thought it might be helpful to know how that works. So the first step here where people can weigh in is in responding to the advance notice of proposed rulemaking, which is what I just described. Uh, we've done that step with respect to both of those rules uh, or potential rules. And the next time is um, after a notice of proposed rulemaking, uh, more and more great government names here, um, a notice of proposed rulemaking, which people sometimes call it NPRM, is um, actually a document, again, published in the Federal Register Notice, but this time it lays out the actual text of a rule, potential rule, and it describes why the agency thinks this might be a good way to go and, and actually gives people the text to comment on. Um, and then with this type of rulemaking, there's also a potential for um, an informal hearing at times. And if a hearing's held and people request to speak, then they can present testimony there. And there could be factual disputes, there could be cross-examination. It's a whole 
thing. So this is a, a long process. It involves a lot of steps. And, you know, the, the commission's burden is also um, significant. If the commission promulgates a rule, it must issue a statement regarding the prevalence of the acts or practices that are covered by the rule and about the costs and benefits of the rule, all the costs it's going to impose, uh, all the potential benefits to consumers, and with a particular focus on small business entities and how they'll be affected. So that's some information about the process. Um, and if people want to try to ask questions, then I can do my best to answer them. Um, but uh, I think that's going to be most of what I can say. The, Another part of what the FTC thinks about is education, um, both for consumers and for businesses, and then research. Um, and part of the reason I think this event is so exciting to participate in is that I think that educating people about any kind of consumer protection issue is just of such critical importance. Because uh, even as somebody who loves to go to court and, you know, bring cases, it is so much better for somebody to never lose their money in the first place, obviously. And what we see over and over again with our cases is some of the money spent. You can't, even if you have all the tools in the world, you can't always get it back into people's pockets once they've lost it. So the much better thing is to get the word out, to arm people with information so that that never happens in the first place, which is why it's just wonderful to see such a flourishing of of information out there in the public sphere about pyramid schemes. We try to contribute to that too. Um, luckily, you know, it's lawyers who drafted that impossible advance notice of proposed rulemaking that, <laughs> as Michelle said, and I totally agree, was an act of heroism to read. <laughs> Um, but luckily, not everyone who works at the FTC is a lawyer. We also have a really amazing division of consumer and business education. They, you know, work with the Center for Applied Linguistics, and they really think about how to communicate with people um, in a in a direct way that's meaningful. And so we put a lot of effort into this. You know, the lawyers working with those communication specialists to try to do a good job. Um, and it's something we're always looking at and, and trying to improve. And so if people, um, you know, I've heard some feedback today about some of that. If people have additional feedback, we'd really like to hear that um, because I think it's a really important part of what all of us do. Um, in terms of what we have available, there are articles that are directed toward consumers. And what you see on the left of the screen here is um, one of those. Um, we have articles directed toward business guidance. And then to the right, you see one example of a business blog post. We have consumer alerts and blog posts that come out regularly um, about our law enforcement actions, but also importantly about trends that we're seeing in the data. You know, is there a new type of scam that where there's an uptick and we want to warn people about it? We're constantly trying to put out updated information and advice for people. And we love working with partners to make sure that we don't miss anything, which is something that, um, that I really focus on and, and I'm happy to continue doing. Um, it, this segues right into our Every Community Initiative. Um, the FTC is really focused on trying to make sure that we reach every community, um, not just people who have heard of the Federal Trade Commission. And a lot of times um, you have to be really strategic in how you do that if you want it to be effective. Here you can see a few different examples of our materials. The consumer.ftc.gov is the big site where we have um, a lot of information about all of the issues we handle from privacy, you know, AI, financial issues. It's, it's a really wide uh, array of issues that we cover, and you can find all of that there. Consumer.gov under that is a, um, is a site that we actually launched kind of in response from um, comments that we had received from legal services attorneys and community groups and others that we really needed something that was more um, plain and simple and on the level of the basics. And so this one, consumer.gov is really popular with like legal services attorneys, teachers, community groups, and that has PowerPoint presentations in the toolbox you can see there if anyone's interested in, in using those. 
pass it on. And the top right is um, developed based on research about communicating with older consumers, um, which basically just showed that actually nobody sees themselves as a victim. Nobody sees themselves as vulnerable, nobody. And so um, trying to talk to people as, um, you know, powerful people who have a lot of experience who can be heroes in their community by helping pass on information about scams and fraud uh, is what we have found to be really effective there. And then down in the bottom right here, um, some examples of some of our photo novelas, which are um, in Spanish. Uh, the one you see here, Estafa de Ingresos, is income scam, so relevant to what we're doing today. We um, also make a lot of these things available for bulk order. So if people are doing like IRL outreach and ever want to look on our website, um, you may be able to find some something you can use. Um, one thing just to mention in this section is that um, and maybe, oh no, I'm going to say that later. Okay. So um, last resource here is at ftc.gov slash data. We have um, started to try to make the information about consumer reports that we receive more available to the public. Uh, we get tens of thousands of reports per week um, on all different topics. And these are our bread and butter. You know, we use them every single day when we're targeting, when we're bringing law enforcement actions. You know, it makes us able to reach out to people who have experienced that. Um, when we are working with um, law enforcement partners, because it's not just us who have access to these reports, but any law enforcer can get access to it. Um, but we also want to make the data available for other people to the extent that we can too. So others can spot trends in their communities or trends with certain types of fraud. And so over the last few years, we've increasingly um, put more and more of this uh, up on a quarterly basis, and you can kind of explore through and see what's interesting. Right now, this is showing you, um, quote, the big view at ftc.gov slash data. So all of the Sentinel reports about, and I've um, filtered by business and job opportunities, and you, you're seeing trends over time there. Um, and it's just kind of interesting. I thought you might be interested to see job scams and employment agencies. Is that green line at the top? Um, high numbers there. Pyramids and multi-level marketing is the pink line. So um, it's it's a lot lower than the job scams and employment agencies. Um, I've talked before, and, and we definitely know that there are a lot of reasons that people do not file reports about their experiences with pyramid schemes. Um, but this is, um, frankly, you know, an issue uh, for us, and and it is really wonderful when people can file reports about their experiences with pyramid schemes. Um, and so that's that's one plug I wanted to make. And um, on the last slide here, um, I do just want to pitch a few other things. So so one is if you're interested in getting consumer alerts from the FTC, these are just like short readable, I promise, not like the ANPR, but just like a short blog post about um, what we're seeing in trends or our cases. And um, you can sign up for them at the link you see here. The, um, the data trends site is there. And you can also sign up for data spotlights, which is one of my favorite things that we put out. They're really interesting, maybe just like once a month, but a deeper dive into the trends that we're seeing around a particular area. Um, and then here's my pitch. Please encourage people to file reports if they see illegal conduct. And I would just love for this to be, um, you know, more well known that they can file reports at reportfraud.ftc.gov. Um, the, the best report for a law enforcer is obviously the report that has the name and the phone number so that if we're doing an investigation, we can call the person um, and get more information. But I will say that no data field is required in order to fill out a report. So if somebody just wants us to know about their experience and wants to file it anonymously, they can absolutely do that. Or if they want to file through their lawyer or through a community member um, so that we're not contacting them directly, that is also completely fine. Um, I also wanted to note that anything you see 
that the FTC has made <laughs> is in the public domain. We love for people to use all of that stuff. So copy and paste, um, do whatever um, you would like with anything that we put out. We just really want to spread the word. And so i um, thrilled to see people using things and however, uh, however you like to. Um, and then in case it's relevant to anyone, all of the resources I've mentioned are available in Spanish as well. Um, but we also have certain materials in other languages too, and you can look for that at ftc.gov slash languages. Um, and I think one other thing I wanted to say, because I talked about our data in terms of research, but also um, on the research front, we work with economists very closely when it comes to our pyramid scheme work. And um, just really uh, interested in seeing more research in this area. We have a lot of ideas about what would be interesting and useful. And so if anyone knows of researchers um, who are interested in this space, uh, happy to always talk with them as well. And that's all I have for now. Thank you, Emma. And next, uh, John Braille uh, from uh, the National Consumer League. Uh, hi. So uh, you've almost made it. I am. I am not the last person standing between you and and uh, whatever liquid refreshment you're seeking after this is done. Um, but uh, I am really glad that we've made it uh, almost to the end of, of the of the day. And thank you all for your attention. Um, and especially thank you all to the work you do. Um, you know, uh, it's easy for uh, those of us who sort of live here in Washington and think about this stuff full time um, to overlook the amazing work you all are doing every day in raising awareness about um, multi-level marketing and the harm it does to consumers. Um, and so if uh, people haven't thanked you enough already for what you're doing, um, I'd like to thank you myself. So thank you. Um, so uh, I'm John Brayo. I'm uh, the Vice President of Public Policy, Telecom and Fraud at the National Consumers League. Uh, we are a 124 years young consumer advocacy organization. Um, I wear a lot of hats there. Uh, but um, one of the ones I'm most proud of is working uh, on our fraud.org campaign. Um, this is our consumer education and empowerment campaign uh, that's all about helping consumers spot and avoid uh, frauds and scams of all kinds and advocate advocating for public policies that help protect them um, from that fraud. And it's uh, through that work that um, we first got involved back in 2013 um, in fighting the MLM industry. Um, so, uh, if I can take you back in a little bit of a history, uh, you may recall a guy named Bill Ackman, um, who gave a 300 plus, uh, multi-hour presentation and investor conference, uh, in 20, uh, I believe it was late 2012, um, laying out the case for why Herbalife was a pyramid scheme. Um, we, uh, watched that presentation with great interest, um, because we were also receiving complaints at fraud.org from consumers who have been victims of pyramid, of, uh, pyramid schemes. And, uh, you know, we said, well, this sounds pretty interesting. Uh, looks like there's potential for fraud here, but let's uh, invite the other side to come in and talk to us. So uh, in the period, uh, the period about a week and a half, we had two billionaires come into our office um, and our, with our sort of hand-me-down AFL-CIO furniture. Um so first we had uh, we had uh, uh, Michael Johnson, who at the time was the CEO of Herbalife, uh, then uh, the highest paid CEO in the country, come in and tell us uh, why Herbalife was not a pyramid scheme um, and why they were a fantastic opportunity for anybody who wanted to build a business. Um, and uh, a week later, we had Bill Ackman and his group come in uh, from Pershing Square and tell us the exact opposite thing. Um, and after listening to them both and giving uh, and, and asking a lot of hard questions, um, we decided to ask the FTC to investigate Herbalife. Um, that was March 12th, 2013. Um, exactly one year to the day later, uh, March 12th, 2014, the FTC announced its investigation uh, of Herbalife, uh, which we spent then spent the next two and a half years tracking and contributing evidence to finding victims um, uh, all over the country that we could help the FTC with this case. Um, and in July, 2016, the FTC settled with Herbalife um, getting $200 million in redress for uh, victims of what they said was not a pyramid scheme, but it was not not a pyramid scheme um, at the time. Um, so coming out of that fight, um, 
you know, it was uh, the the industry um, uh, re recognized that it had a problem on its hands, um, that it had a uh, Federal Trade Commission that was empowered uh, to go after um, an industry that for years, decades um, had been beset with allegations of fraud and pyramid scheme activity. Um, and then an election happened uh, and uh, we had a new administration come in and the uh, of which the president, three of his cabinet members um, were either uh, directly former um, uh, uh, MLM uh, owners or operators, uh, the most notable being Betsy DeVos, mm -hmm. um, who's the secretary of education. The president himself had run multiple MLMs or at least had multiple ones under his his name um we had a republican congress and so the industry decided to activate um and they activated by pursuing a bill called the anti-pyramid promotional scheme act of 2017 um despite its consumer sounding consumer friendly sounding name um it was uh basically if it had become law it would have overturned 40 years of case law um by going by changing the central test of the Coscott case, which Peter and, and Bill and many people here are very familiar with, um, basically allowing um, MLMs to not have to count sales to ultimate users of the product uh, for periods for purposes of meeting the Coscott test. In other words, anybody who bought the who bought the uh, the uh, product, uh, whether it's for their own consumption uh, or to give away as a gift or any other. Uh, reason would have the ability for, to have that counted um, as a uh, part of meeting this, the Coscott test, which means with the Coscott test being, you have to predominantly 50.1 plus 1% um, make your money from the sale of product and users. Um, and so uh, we activated to fight that at the time, um, not only bringing together uh, groups uh, in the progressive public interest community, of which NCL is one, Consumer Federation, Aaron is here, uh, was a big part of that. Uh, but we quickly realized that relying on left-leaning groups like ours to stop this bill wasn't going to be enough. And we needed to find uh, find allies who could reach across the aisle. Um, not to get too inside baseball, but when you look for an unusual bedfellows uh, and what we do, you usually find them. And uh, we found them first in former FTC uh, commissioners, former FTC bureau chiefs, um, Republicans and Democrats who recognized this bill for what it was, uh, which was an attack on the FTC's authority to protect consumers from fraud. Um, and then <laughs> we interestingly found allies in the direct selling industry itself. Uh, so uh, um, Melaleuca uh, came in and decided that they did not want uh, the rest of the industry operating under rules that would have be looser than the, how they ran their business. And so they got involved in reaching out to Republicans. Um, interestingly enough, Herbalife, who we had spent three years uh, bashing over the head, came in because they were under a consent order. And they also did not want to be operating in a space where that was harder for them to attract distributors than it was for the rest of the industry. Um, exactly. Um, so uh, a couple others came in to Legal Shield, a few others. Uh, and we succeeded at that time in getting the bill uh, to be determined to be um, controversial. So if you're not familiar with sort of Hill speak, um, a controversial bill is one that uh, you will have enough people voting against it that if you vote for it or against it, you'll look bad. And nobody wants to look bad to their constituents back home. And so the bill died an ignominious death um, only to come back at literally 1130 at night. Uh, in as a rider and appropriations bill put forward by Congressman Dan Quigley, um, who is from uh, Michigan, I think Michigan in the um, uh, in the district right next to Amway's headquarters. Um, and she, uh, so they they got it added in uh, to this appropriations bill, which we're not familiar with appropriations bill. Don't get familiar because uh, it's it's not worth your time. But in this case. Uh, basically, if you have an appropriations rider, appropriations bills have to be passed every year, and there's a high likelihood that this would be included uh, in that bill. Again, we activated, we got it to be considered uh, controversial. It was finally stripped out um, on the floor, uh, and we 
hoped we had finally put a uh, put a, a stake into the pyramid scheme uh, bill. 2018, November, Democrats take over Congress. And we uh, said, OK, I think we're safe, but let's just be clear. We sent a letter along with nine other consumer organizations to um, uh, Congressman Vesey and Congressman Hudson, who had taken over from uh, uh, Marsha Blackburn, who'd been elected to the Senate, saying, please don't make us do all this work again. Don't reintroduce this bill um, uh, again. And so far, they've listened to us. Uh, the problem here is that the DSA needs to do things to have its members pay its bills, pay it, pay it, pay dues to it. And they're very good at continuing to do things to collect dues. Um, and so uh, they have been active at the state level um, in uh, just last year. Uh, they managed to get through the Kansas legislature, a version of the Anti-Pyramid Promotional Scheme Act that made Kansas the 28th state uh, to have uh, such a bill on the, on the books, um, which is bad, um, but not awful the way the federal bill was because the FTC is primarily the enforcer here under federal law. States don't usually get that involved in going after uh, pyramid schemes or MLMs. Um, but still, it's a, it's emblematic of the resources of the DSA and their members continue to put into making life easier for MLMs from a regulatory perspective. Just to put that in perspective, uh, last year, they had 130 meetings with congressional offices. They had five town halls with members of Congress. They filed six comment letters with feds in the states. They tracked 81 bills. They got eight co-sponsors for a bill that would preserve the ability of, of the industry to call their distributors independent contractors. Um, they brought 60 sellers and 17 executives to the Hill to meet with members of Congress last year. Remember, this is we're still coming out of COVID. Uh, and uh, they had 11 liaison meetings with state AGs. And if that weren't enough, uh, they also managed to find time to oppose direct selling bans in Vietnam and Bahrain. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. So, uh, and, and in 2023, they're still involved. They're trying to, they're pushing at DOL uh, to make sure that they can continue to call their distributors independent contractors because they don't want them to have to ask for silly things like a minimum wage. Um, I know. Um, and so um, our expectation is that they are going to continue to be very active uh, throughout this year. Um, uh, as Katie was just talking about, the ANPR um, in the Business Opportunity Rule Review is the first step in a very long uh, regulatory process at the Federal Trade Commission. Um, the FTC, because of uh, our Supreme Court, now has to go through a much longer regulatory process to pass things into rule than they did prior to the AMG decision. Um, and uh, we fully expect that when we get to the NPR stage, that the DSA will mobilize. Uh, their members to oppose uh, the uh, MLMs being covered under the business opportunity rule. Um, the last time uh, this came up, which was 2011, that's right. yeah, 2011, um, the DSA managed to get more than 20,000 uh, distributors to file comments um, at the uh, DO, at the FTC asking for MLMs uh, to be excluded. From uh, from the business opportunity rule, they did so successfully, um, uh, and I fully anticipate that they will do this again if the FTC proposes to cover them. Um, fortunately, the difference between then and now is we have the internet, and we have social media, and people like the folks in this room who have built up um, a very uh, strong and visible group of grassroots support to make sure that um, what happened in 2011 uh, doesn't happen again. Um, and so, uh, you know, there is uh, power numbers here. So um, I, I uh, realize that reading ANPRs and following regulatory proceedings is a chore, but trust me, um, it's worth it. And you can make this, um, you can make this uh, uh, meaningful and, and understandable to your average consumer about the threat here. Um, put this in perspective, um, last year, uh, business and job opportunity scams were the second most expensive kind of scam that a consumer could fall victim to, according to complaints of the FTC. It's $2,000 is the median loss. Um, that's second only behind investment-related scams, which was $5,000. Um, and interestingly, as more MLMs get interested in crypto, there's a nice little nexus going on between the two types of scams. Um, 
uh, over the past three years, uh, crypto-related scams have gone up from 1,566 median loss to 5,000 last year. So um, definitely an area to keep uh, to keep an eye on. Um, I won't go into, into, into sort of more of the statistics about that, um, but just to note that as you are no doubt aware, um, uh, the growth of social media is an accelerating factor, not just for the work that you all are doing, um, but for the industry itself. Um, uh, in 2021, the FTC did a report. They found that 95,000 individuals uh, who reported losses to investing offers um, uh, that were that were that that those investing offers were initiated on social media platforms. It's an 18 x 18 time higher increase than 2017. Um, so um, you know this is clearly still a problem. Um, and I, I think, you know, having allies in this fight is going to be really important um, as we move forward on this. Um, uh, in ter terms of uh, what's happening in the meantime, the rulemakings that that Katie talked about are incredibly important. I would say even though comment periods um, have closed on those, um, you can still file comments. Um, this is what's known as ex parte. Um, the FTC is under no obligation to take these into consideration. When they're developing their rules, um, but I can tell you from experience they do pay attention. Um, so uh, you know, certainly if you have folks who want to um, write letters um, to the FTC, there is still that opportunity to file them in those proceedings. Um, uh, along with Aaron Aaron Witte uh, in the back here from CFA, um, we have filed comments um, calling for MLMs to be covered under the business opportunity rule. Um, we've also urged the commission. Uh, to um, uh, to initiate its earnings claim uh, uh, rulemaking. Um, the BizOp rule is sort of an existing rule. It's just said so we're saying cover MLMs. Earnings claims is a new one. Um, and it would simply say uh, that um, uh, unfair, deceptive, or unsubstantiated earnings claims are against the law. Um, and so why is it important to have these things under rule? Um, sorry to get uh, um, sort of a little deep in the weeds with you here, but when Katie talked to you about the AM, the AMG decision um, in the uh, Supreme Court, the important thing here is that the what the Supreme Court took away was the ability of the commission to get consumer re redress under a rule called 13B. Um, it was already difficult for the FTC to bring pyramid scheme cases, right? Because they had to show each time that under the facts of that particular case, uh, the this company was violating Section five of the FTC Act. So uh, I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations with folks at the commission uh, from the from the chair on down, where I tried to make generalizations about all MLM from the uh, Herbalife or the the Vima or the Burn Lounge case, and the response immediately was, "Well, those those are fact determined, fact sensitive, right? Meaning we can only apply the facts from Herbalife to Herbalife's case, the facts from Vima to Vima's case." Getting their conduct under rule would change that. It would say, we don't have to prove every single time that Herbalife violated Section 5 and Vima Vet violated Section 5 with all of these facts that we have to take months and years and lots of economists and lots of lawyers to pull together. We can simply say, you violated the rule, right? And by violating the rule, it becomes much easier to hold them accountable. Um, and so that's why it's important for uh, us to get uh, the business opportunities under, uh, uh, sorry, the MLMs under the BizOp rule, and also get the earnings claims uh, rule passed, um, because it means that the FTC can do its job much more efficiently. Um, so, uh, talked about the 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 rule. Um, in terms of what else could be could we do? Um, so, when we uh, were fighting Herbalife, um, we started hearing rumblings. Uh, in early uh, 2016, I think, that there was a settlement uh, on the way. And so we sent a list of remedies that the commission should seek. Um, some of them they included in the settlement um, with Herbalife, some they did not. But we do think that our list provides um, a, a good roadmap for how the entire MLM industry could be better regulated. Number one, cover the MLMs under the BizOp rule. Number two, prohibit unfair and deceptive earnings claims. Um, and require that uh, at least 51% of total product sales by a distributor's organization be made to consumers outside the organization. So you can't count sales uh, to other distributors for purposes of meeting your 51% rule. 
rule. Um, eliminate, eliminating any personal or group inventory purchasing qualification requirements. Um, so no auto reload uh, uh, requirements. Um, requiring uh, the tracking and public disclosure of all costs associated, associated with uh, starting up and maintaining a distributorship. Um, this would address the issue we saw earlier where we saw the, the sort of upside down slide. Here's how much they made, here's how much they cost, and there was no way to actually account for that. They'd have to report that. Um, they would have to uh, um, verifiably document and publicly disclose the percentage of their product sales uh, to distributors inside the network versus consumers outside the network. Um, prohibit misleading testimonials um, and uh, uh, require um, public prominent and ongoing disclosure of uh, of names and addresses of dis of distributors. And at that we're talking about nutrition clubs for Herbalife, but this could apply in other contexts as well um, to other potential distributors in the specific markets. So that's one we would probably tweak if we were to put that out today, publishing the um, uh, names and addresses of people online is not a great idea anymore. But certainly we do think there is more that could be done to make sure that um, uh, to make sure that people know that if they are getting into a, a particular MLM, if there are 50 other people in your town who are selling the same thing, there's a market saturation problem. Um, so um, what are we doing going forward? Uh, just to wrap up here. Um, you know, in addition to keeping an eye out for the return of the Anti-Pyramid Promotional Scheme Act, trying to keep an, uh, an eye on what's going on in the states, making sure that the FTC does the right thing in the earnings claims, uh, NPR, and the business opportunity rule review. Um, we're also focusing um, our consumer education uh, uh, efforts on addressing something that a lot of you in the NTMLM community have talked about today, which is the stigma, Right. So uh, when Katie put up there the low numbers of complaints to the FTC about BizOp, um, that's something that, that the, um, the industry will point to all the time in saying why we don't need regulation. Well, if we need a regulation, we'd see a lot more complaints, right? Even though we know that fraud is a fraud generally, not just in BizOp, fraud generally is a historically under underreported crime. Um, for some reason, we consider fraud victims in this country to be... Um, uh, to be uh, often at fault uh, for being um, for being victims, we use terms like duped and fell for. Um, the headlines you read about this in the in the in the news often talk about um, uh, the victim as opposed to the crime and the criminal. Um, and so uh, that filters that filters throughout the ecosystem, and it makes it so that local police departments don't want to take uh, reports from fraud victims. They don't get the resources they need to have people in place to investigate financial crime. Um, and so uh, I will tell you from my own personal um, uh, uh, work, uh, when you talk to journalists a lot, they often ask you at the, at the last question, is there anything else you want to add? And the last thing I always add whenever I'm talking about fraud is focus on the crime and the criminal. Talk about the culpability of the organization and the company in defrauding consumers. Don't focus on what people could have done to avoid this, right? Because when we're talking about fraud, and I think this applies to MLMs, we are often talking about professional criminals, people who do this all day, every day, and know the psychological triggers to tap into to get people to do what you want, which in the case of fraud means parting you and your money. Um, so um, just I would just say, you know, keep doing what you're doing, focus on the, the, the crime and the criminals, um, and make sure that the people that you're helping to activate take action. File complaints at the Federal Trade Commission. Your state AGs are also a great resource um, to go to. Even if you're in one of the 28 states that didn't do the right thing on promotional schemes, they still have UDAP laws. Um, and um, you know, by speaking up, uh, they can't ignore you. Um, so keep doing what you're doing. Thank you for what you're doing. Um, and I will ha have my card to whoever wants it. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have slides in my info. So thank you. Thank you, John, for that. We really appreciate it and all the efforts. And I was fortunate enough to work with John on an issue back in those years. And he got us uh, able to talk to some people. And um, I think that those efforts really made a difference. 
All right, our last speaker, and I know we're running late, and I want to just say thanks for those of you in the among the attendees who have hung in with us. Our last speaker is uh, Douglas Brooks, who's going to uh, comment on some of the, the the language and the comments we've heard with regard to the AMPR. Is that right? And then we're going to call it a day. Um, and I'll I have just very short uh, wrap up comments um, after that, and there might even be some sort of liquid refreshment in my future um, <laughs> today. So I'll, I'll try to be, I, I know it's it's late now, so I'll try to uh, rip through this. Um, I'm, I'm calling this a caustic summary because after our first conference, uh, I think it was social selling news referred to us as uh, the, the usual caustic uh, commentators. So <laughs> here we go again. Um, I What I've done, it, 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 the, Katie mentioned there's 32 responses to the BizOp uh, ANPR, and I, I focused on four of them, which are <clears throat> basically the industry response, um, which is <clears throat> we don't need regulation. Um, and and the, the four responses are, there's a letter from uh, three senators, uh, Michael Lee, Mitt Romney, and Marsha Blackburn, um, uh, a letter from three representatives, Richard Hudson, Mark Beasy, and Tim Wahlberg. Uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce uh, weighed in, and of course, the Direct Selling Association, which was the longest of, of, of the four. Um, all of these, they, they had four, or they had three uh, basic arguments that they all made in, in some form. And then the uh, Chamber of Commerce and the DSA made a few additional uh, arguments. But the, the big three, um, the first one is, uh, oh, gee whiz, you're, you, you did the earnings claim ANPR, and now you've done the business op ANPR, and we're terribly confused, and there's going to be conflicts, and uh, uh, all of the millions of, they use the term, micro entrepreneurs, uh, they're going to be confused, and it's unfair, uh, and don't do it. Deal with the do the earnings claim rule first, and then uh, uh, address the uh, the bizop rule. Um, and, and for me, I, I think that th this is a sort of simple one to respond to. Um, the the franchise rule and the bizop rule both have uh, prohibitions of deceptive earnings claims, and. It, I think it would be a, a sort of a simple thing for, for any prospective earnings claims rule to uh, exempt uh, entities that are covered by the franchise rule or the biz op rule. Um, and I, I, I just, that, that sort of seems to be obvious to me. Maybe there's something I'm missing, it's very possible, but uh, that, that's, that would certainly be my recommendation. And that would uh, that would avoid any confusion or any conflict um, that 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 might otherwise exist. Uh, so there's no reason to not go forward with both rulemakings at the same time. I, I I do have to talk about that that the millions of micro entrepreneurs because I think that the the picture that the DSA and the the other commentators want to create is that it's it's the the mom and pop the low level distributors that are gonna be hurt by any regulation because they're the ones who are recruiting. So presumably they're the ones that are gonna be uh, uh, covered by these rules. And I, I, I don't think that that's seriously the intent of these rules. It's, it's the, the, the contracts are all signed with the MLM companies and uh, it, the, the burden of disclosure is gonna be on on the MLM companies, and and we don't know exactly how many there are, but maybe it's maybe it's seven hundred, maybe it's a thousand. We're not sure because most of them are privately held. But uh, the specter of having millions of distributors having to uh, prepare disclosure statements or uh, be burdened by some complicated uh, FTC rule is 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 really nonsense. Um, the next. Uh, industry argument is is don't mess with the MLM exemption and and you know we've we've heard uh, 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 prior speakers talk about the the business opportunity rule and the fact that uh, 
uh, MLM was exempted from the rule. Uh, as all of these uh, commentators uh, are basically saying that's that exemption is sacred uh, and don't don't even think about looking at it again. Uh, you know, you made a, a wise decision back then, and and uh, that's fixed in stone. Uh, you know, don't change it. And you know, my response would be. Um, you know, number one, I mean, I, I've made some mistakes in my life, and when I make a mistake, I, I try to acknowledge it and 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 un, you know work to undo it. So, I, and I don't know institutionally if this is possible for the FTC, but but uh, I certainly think that um, uh, uh, you know a long time as you know ten years have passed. Uh, from the, the promulgation of the BISOP rule. Actually, the decision to, to exempt MLM was even older than that. It was uh, uh, in, I think, 2008 uh, or in, in, that, in that ballpark because the, uh, uh, I mean, the, 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 uh, rule, the rulemaking really started in the mid 90s and then the, uh, the initial uh, BISOP rule uh, uh, came out in 2006, and at that time it did cover uh, MLM, uh, and and there was a lengthy uh, statement of of uh, basis and purpose uh, uh, that that justified uh, covering uh, MLM companies as well as other business opportunities, and and uh, uh, there really was no reason to exempt MLM. There's no cogent reason to exempt MLMs. They they just they they. Uh, uh, they did the the, the lobbying thing, um, but it, certainly the experience of the FTC since the promulgation of the BISOP rule uh, is more than enough to justify uh, taking a second look at the exemption. Uh, and we've heard speakers talk about Herbalife, uh, Burn Lounge, Vima, Neora. Uh, I'll add in Fortune High Tech Marketing, which was a joint prosecution with the FTC and, and uh, four states. Uh, all of those took place after uh, the promulgation of the BISOP rule, and all of them demonstrate uh, the, the, the endemic uh, fraud and deception uh, in, in uh, the multi-level marketing uh, industry. Um, and really what, what what's what happened with the MLM exemption that it resulted in uh, a, a, an anomalous situation where there, every other type of business opportunity seller, whether you're selling franchises or other types of business opportunities, you are covered by a, uh, a pre-sale disclosure rule, unless you're MLM. Uh, I, I just don't see uh, any any cogent basis for that. I see ample basis for uh, doing uh, at least something to protect consumers. And just to be clear that the BizOp rule is a very modest uh, set of, of, of disclosures. It's a one page form. Uh, uh, you know, I, and I, I, I have submitted a, a comment to the, uh, uh, the FTC in connection with the, the earnings claims uh, ANPR. Uh, suggesting that they increase the, uh, you know, expand the, the disclosures that are required because I think it's called for. Uh, I, I don't, I probably am, am, am you know, uh, you know, spitting in the wind on that one, but, but uh, I, I make the argument anyway. Um, the third common argument is that um, the, 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 the industry doesn't need more regulation because it, it self-regulates. Uh, and the, the, all of the commentators uh, um, point out that the DSA and the Better Business Bureau have created uh, something called the Direct Selling Self-Regulatory Council, uh, which uh, means that the FTC really doesn't need to do anything. Um, and the DSA uh, adds an argument that um, even though uh, AMG Capital Management uh, pulled the rug out from, from the uh, FTC's ability to get restitution, uh, there are uh, other existing enforce enforcement mechanisms that are uh, sufficient. So you don't really need to change anything. Um, you know, my response here is, is 
uh, and I, I'm, I'm going to rely heavily on uh, truthandadvertising.org. Uh, unfortunately, Bonnie Patton's out of uh, the country. She couldn't be here uh, today. But uh, Tina did a great job um, on analyzing the uh, uh, efficacy of the, uh, uh, the self-regulatory council. Uh, and basically, uh, they 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 blew it apart. They they analyzed it very very carefully in terms of of the uh, proceedings and the results, uh, and uh, it, it's it it has simply not been effective in uh, uh, preventing consumer harm. Um, uh, and again, the, the the Tina also uh, several years ago did a great study on. Uh, uh, deceptive earnings claims by uh, MLM recruiters, and uh, they found numerous, you know, hundreds and even thousands of deceptive claims uh, by a wide, by 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 basically every member of of the uh, of the MLM of, of the DSA. Uh, you know, so these are this is supposedly the cream of the crop, uh, and uh, just about all of them are, uh, you know, uh, serial offenders. Um, another reason why uh, the, the self industry self regulation or the, or the, the, the direct selling uh, self regulation uh, is, is not going to be effective is because there are hundreds of MLM companies that are not members of the DSA, uh, and they have really no incentive to uh, comply with uh, orders issued by the, uh, or not their, they're not orders, they're suggestions or recommendations, whatever they call it. Uh, it they certainly, they have no uh, enforcement power. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we, we've certainly seen, you know, ample evidence of non-members of the DSA um, uh, you know, committing the same kinds of, of deception and fraud that, that members of the DSA commit. Um, so I, I, I just don't think they, they make their case that industry self-regulation is working in, in this industry. Um, the, 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 the efficacy of existing enforcement mechanisms, I think that that's sort of a complicated topic that, that we're at the end of the day. I'm not going to try to uh, address that, but uh, it, 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 the, 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 uh, and Katie really explained uh, how uh, the FTC is, is, uh, uh, is affected by uh, the AMG case, and I, I don't need to add anything to that. Um, I'll, dr I'll address a few of the other arguments that are made. The, the, the Chamber of Commerce, um, they uh, mentioned something called the Major Questions Doctrine. And I had to look this one up. Uh, I, I'm not a constitutional lawyer, um, <clears throat> but this is based on a, 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 a Supreme Court case that came down uh, last year. Um, uh, and it's, a, it's a basically a way for uh, uh, the, 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 the court to uh, overturn agency regulations that it feels uh, are just too uh, 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 overarching the two, uh, uh, they involve vast economic and political significance. And uh, you know, basically what the, what the Supreme Court says is that if, if you're, if, if, you, if you're an agency that is, uh, is purporting to govern an area that is, is, has a big impact on, on the, on the country, uh, and it's unclear that Congress really intended for this agency to have that kind of power. Uh, uh, they're not going. They're 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 going to overturn that regulation. Um, it 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 remains unclear just how far that uh, that major questions doctrine is 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 going to be extended, but. Uh, it's a little hard for me to see how it should apply or why it should apply in this case. Um, Bill Keep in, in, in uh, his uh, some of several of his writings that are available on Seeking Alpha has pointed out that the MLM industry accounts for less than one percent of retail sales in, in, in the nation. So I, I would say it's not vast. Um, and 
it, and, and I should also say the FTC in this case has clear congressional authorization uh, to prevent unfair deceptive acts or practices in trade or commerce. That, that is the precise language from uh, the uh, enabling statute that, that Katie referred to earlier. So this is not an instance where uh, the, the agency is sort of trying to expand its bounds. This, this uh, type of regulation that we're talking about is well within the, uh, the wheelhouse uh, uh, of the FTC. And then finally, um, th this idea that, that business opportunity sellers should make pre-sale disclosures uh, has been around uh, since the 1970s with the, uh, the, the promulgation of the franchise rule. Uh, no one has seriously questioned the, the uh, ability of the, uh, the FTC to, to uh, uh, regulate in this area. So I, I just don't think that, that, uh, that the major questions doctrine should you know, pose a real obstacle. Um, <clears throat> the DSA makes a number of arguments. I'm not going to be able to, to, to deal with them all today. Uh, the first one I, I'm saying that they're, 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 they're saying disclosures are discouraging. Uh, and what they've done is they've referred to a, um, uh, a survey that they did back when the, when the business opportunity rule was, was being uh, discussed. It was a survey done by uh, uh, Nathan Associates, uh, which basically concluded that uh, if you told people that uh, for instance, they had to wait seven days to uh, uh, before they could sign up as an MLM distributor, or if you told them about uh, uh, lawsuits or told them about uh, 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 refund uh, programs, that that would chill their interest in joining the company. And uh, my my response to that is, well, that's sort of the point. Uh, we want people to think before they, they join. And yeah, some of them are going to say, you know, maybe I'm not going to join this thing. Uh, and, you know, and if that happens, then the business opportunity rule is working. Um, and I, I also, I'll, I'll make an argument, but, you know, maybe the MLM folks will laugh at me, but I think they benefit if they don't, if they don't, if someone doesn't join them, because they they don't like the fact that there are lawsuits against a company or that uh, or they have to wait seven days. I, I think uh, you know they're 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 benefiting because they don't have to deal with someone who's ultimately going to be disappointed. Because we know most of them are going to end up being disappointed. Um, and again, another rhetorical question: you know, if if MLM is such a great opportunity, why would truthful disclosures be discouraging. Uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense. The DSA also argues that the, uh, the business opportunity rule is outdated. Uh, now we have the internet and social media. Uh, so we have more informed consumers who can easily and quickly research other consumer experiences in the business to make an informed decision. I'm quoting the DSA. And we have social media people here. Uh, I, I, it's hard for me to believe that they're actually making this argument, but uh, you know there it is, and I I I, I have a couple of problems with it. Uh, first of all, uh, MLM companies we've seen this; they use SEO techniques to bury unfavorable reviews. Uh, they are aggressively uh, enforcing non-disparagement clauses, threatening people with defamate, defamation claims. Uh, they are trying to shut down uh, critics. So for the DSA to argue, you know, people don't need disclosures, they can just go on the internet, uh, is, is undercut by the fact that the industry is trying to shut down uh, critics. Uh, and just in, in general, I, I, I don't think, I think it, I am a total supporter of, of, of the folks on social media getting the truth out there and, on, and everything that they're doing. But I don't believe that that is a, a substitute for truthful disclosures by MLM companies. It is only the MLM companies that have the inside data on earnings claims or on all of the other things that, that uh, data that they collect uh, from, the, from their distributors. Uh, and 
particularly as 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 to earnings. So I, I think uh, that the 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 idea that that the internet and social media is a substitute for for formal uh, disclosures is is uh, ridiculous. Um, and I think this, well, yeah, the, the, the final one I want to deal with is, is the, the seven day things. I, I think the industry is very concerned about the seven day uh, delay period. Uh, and I happen to think that's, that's a crucial part of, of the business opportunity rule. Uh, I think, um, you know, many a times the, the, the recruitment process uh, in, in, in MLM depends upon people making uh, uh, split decisions at the time when they're vulnerable, when they're uh, uh, caught up in the excitement of the moment. Uh, I think uh, uh, if an opportunity is good uh, today, it, it should be just as good a week from today. And and there should be no, if, if, if there's a legitimate opportunity, there should be no problem with, with having people wait seven days uh, to to think about it, to research it, to talk with their friends and, and uh, uh, colleagues about it. Um, but the, there are a couple parts to the, the argument that the directs the, the DSA makes. The first one, they just pull out of their hat. They just, and I they say many direct sellers engage in the business for specific periods of time and purposes, such as around the holidays. Imposing a seven-day waiting period before being able to sell would delay the earnings opportunities for potential participants who may want to start selling immediately to meet those needs. So you get the scenario here. Someone is so desperate to join an MLM that they, they, they want to start selling right away. They don't want to wait seven days, uh, and that's going to discourage them, and they're not going to be able to make the money that they're looking to make. I, I, you know, it, it's... It, 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 again, it, it's a ridiculous argument. Uh, there is no uh, support. And the DSA submitted an 11 page letter with 38 footnotes. There's no footnote here. There's no reference to any study that they've done about this, uh, uh, you know, this holiday uh, uh, a process of, 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 of people, you know, joining MLMs at specific times. It reminds me of an argument that was made by Herbalife uh, back uh, when Bill Ackman was attacking them. Uh, to explain away the high attrition at lower levels. And, and basically Herbalife said, uh, well, people were meeting their short-term weight loss goals. Uh, again, a sort of a fact-free argument, but, but uh, you know, they're very creative that way. Um, the, 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 uh, uh, I, I, so I, I thought, you know, I looked uh, for any academic study. I, I couldn't find any support for the idea that there is a, a bump up in sales around the holidays. I looked at Herbalife North America sales uh, for the past four years, and they show a dip in the fourth quarter. Uh, so I, I, I don't, I, and I, I guess I'm, I'm not an economist. I should have asked my economist friends to, to, to weigh in on this, but that, that's my caustic uh, view of that uh, argument. Um, <clears throat> finally, uh, the DSA says the seven day waiting period is unnecessary because they have uh, inventory repurchase requirements. So I guess the, the scenario here is um, let people join up because if they turn, it turns out they don't like the business, they can resell the, the stuff they bought at 90% of cost uh, and you know, no harm, no foul. Um, and the problem with this is, uh, uh, that first of all, the we have the sunk cost fallacy. Once someone pays some money, once someone joins someone, once someone makes a decision, uh, there's there's sort of a, a, a psychological uh, uh, push to 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 sort of justify that decision. People don't like to admit. They make mistakes. Institutions don't like to make, admit they make mistakes either, but but that's another point. But so so I, it, it, this you know this ninety percent uh, refund uh, it doesn't deal with that sunk cost fallacy. It also doesn't prevent consumer losses because um, uh, th those are not the only costs. The purchase of inventory is not the only cost that MLM uh, purchasers uh, incur. Uh, they have all kinds of business expenses uh, in, in, in uh, 
uh, travel, in, in sales aids, in uh, uh, advertising, marketing, whatever they do, uh, the costs that they incur uh, are not covered by any uh, uh, repurchase uh, provision that I've seen. Uh, and, and then finally, the, the DSA code of ethics that, that the DSA relies on, uh, as I said before, it, uh, it only applies to, to DSA members and, and that, is, uh, that doesn't cover uh, hundreds of, of MLMs that are uh, uh, not members of the DSA. So, uh, uh, well, they, they also argue that lawsuits are irrelevant. That's one of the th disclosures that the, that the BOR requires uh, sellers to disclose. Um, uh, basically, consumers are uh, can search the internet for legal actions, I, and, I, and again, I, 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 that's just a, a fantasy. Uh, it, it is uh, state court actions are not uh, searchable on the internet uh, in any you know, easy fashion, uh, and and that is, it's, it's unreasonable to expect uh, non-professional, non-legal uh, uh, folks. To, uh, to do that kind of a search, to even think of doing that kind of a search. Um, and this, this kind of requirement, you know, disclosing uh, lawsuits has been part of the franchise rule since 1979, and it has proven to be worthwhile. So I, I think, uh, um, uh, I, 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 I don't think there's any weight to that argument as well. Um, so that's, that's uh, all I have on that part. I, I, I thank you for sitting through this and I thank Bill again for uh, uh, all the amazing work you've done uh, and uh, good night. Thank you. That was great. Uh, clearly to our attendees who stuck in with us, we're running almost an hour late. Um, I just have a few wrap up comments. Just one comment on Doug's uh, presentation. Um, the US, uh, the um, LM, MLM industry is less than 1% US retail sales. Uh, the presence of CEO MLM, of MLM CEOs on the board of directors of Chamber of Commerce is clearly disproportionate to the role this industry plays in our economy. It may not be disproportionate to the harm caused, but it is disproportionate to the role that this industry plays in the economy. And yet uh, it seems to be the, ta the tail that's wagging the Chamber of Commerce dog. Um, so I, I, I think that we need to point out that this is just another effort by the industry to avoid uh, badly needed uh, transparency. I wanna thank the attendees um, who have expressed an interest. Uh, some have e emailed me already and asked for uh, if, if the the videos will be available. We have been recording. I have no idea how to get the recording off the cloud, but I've got people who do, and we will get something ready for you. I want to thank all the presenters and um, the people that made this conference possible, um, and they've just done a terrific job. Although we're running late, it's shorter than two days, uh, which was our last two conferences. I want to point out one other thing, too, before we go, and that is that Jason Jones said that he felt that um, as the social media activists have, have increased their um, voice, that the industry itself may move back from uh, the internet um, to more closed doors. I just want to assure the industry that we will be in your environment wherever you will be. And so thank you for that. And so <laughs> so um, uh, we will be there and we will be watching. Um, and please pay atten uh, attention to future announcements for future events from us. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, yes, we're not gonna be able to do a Q&A. I'm gonna download all the questions and then uh, we will pass them out to whomever they're relevant to and then put them on the, the website. All attendees will hear from me.